The scripture reading for today is from 2 Samuel 6, 1 through 23. Now David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him to Baal Judah, to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the very name of the Lord of hosts, who is enthroned above the cherubim. They placed the ark of God on a new cart, that they might bring it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were leading the new cart. So they brought it with the ark of God from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, and Ahio was walking ahead of the ark. Meanwhile, David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with all kinds of instruments made of fir wood and with lyres, harps, tambourines, castanets, and cymbals. But when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out toward the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen nearly upset it. And the anger of the Lord burned against Uzzah, and God struck him down there for his irreverence, and he died there by the ark of God. David became angry because of the Lord's outburst against Uzzah, and that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. So David was afraid of the Lord that day, and he said, How can the ark of the Lord come to me? And David was unwilling to move the ark of the Lord into the city of David with him. But David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. Thus, the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. Now it was told King David, saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him on account of the ark of God. David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. And so it was that when the bearers of the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed an ox and a fatling. And David was dancing before the Lord with all his might, and David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouting and the sound of the trumpet. Then it happened, as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, that Michal, the daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. So they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent which David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. When David had finished offering the burnt offering and the peace offering, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. Further, he distributed to all the people, to all the multitude of Israel, both to men and women, a cake of bread and one of dates and one of raisins to each one. Then all the people departed, each to his house. But when David returned to bless his household, Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, how the king of Israel distinguished himself today. He uncovered himself today in the eyes of his servant maids, as one of the foolish ones shamelessly uncovers himself. So David said to Michal, It was before the Lord who chose me above your father and above all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore, I will celebrate before the Lord. I will be more lightly esteemed than this and will be humble in my own eyes. But with the maids of whom you have spoken, with them I will be distinguished." Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no child to the day of her death. <clears throat> I'm sure you're familiar. If not, talk to me afterwards. But with uh, C.S. Lewis in his book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And when the four Pevensey children who find themselves through the wardrobe and in the land of Narnia uh, find themselves in the, in the home of Mr. and Mrs. Beaver, it's at that time that uh, they discover that Aslan, Aslan, who is supposed to be the ruler of Narnia, is actually a lion. And so Susan exclaims, Ooh, is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. That she will, dearie, and make no mistake, said Mrs. Beaver. If there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most or just silly. Then he isn't safe, said Lucy. Safe? said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about being safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. Now, of course, this is just a fantasy about talking beavers in a faraway land of Narnia. But Lewis had also previously written in his book, Mere Christianity, a collection of essays. He wrote, some people talk as if meeting the gaze of absolute goodness, that is God, would be fun. They need to think again. They're only still playing with religion. Goodness is either the great safety or the great danger, according to the way you react to it. 
and we have reacted the wrong way. So that's the question for us, is how do we react to the goodness that is God, to the reality of who God is? Do we see God as someone who would hopefully just come alongside of us and give us all the things that we need, all the comfort, the happiness, the health that we're asking for? Or are we prepared instead to recognize God for who he is on his terms? Perhaps finding out that he's not quite as safe as we would like to think. So the question then is, what do we do if God turns out to be so terrible and powerful that in his presence it would mean certain death? Or is it possible to find comfort and love and peace when we approach him? And I think that's what we wrestle with in today's text. David and everybody else involved here learns that to enter God's presence or to allow him to break into our lives requires a proper appreciation for who he is. So if you and I want to see God acting in our lives, it's important for us to consider what it means to be in his presence. Just who is it to whom we are drawing near? So that's our question. How are we to enter into God's presence? That's the recurring question throughout this passage. And at this critical point in David's life, what did he discover was the proper way to enter God's presence? And so what can we discover as well? So let's look at our text in chapter 6, uh, which is very interesting, interestingly kind of arranged in, in two equal halves, it seems. The first 11 verses and the, and the last uh, 12 or so verses, which uh, both describe an attempt to bring the ark of God to Jerusalem, both with slightly different outcomes. Uh, before we uh, go on, so I would say that the first portion, which is verses 1 through 11, would tell us how do we enter God's presence. We enter his presence with trembling, okay? Just let's, let's look for that. Before we get into the text, though, let's remember where we are. Actually, I have, uh, let's see if this comes on. Somebody's magically moving the slides for me. Uh, and the first, uh, first thing is we need to enter God's presence. But secondly, let's remember where we are in the movement of the book of 2 Samuel. Um, it tells us that you know, the first uh, five chapters really presented us with who David is. Uh, David is that man who is the one after God's own heart that we heard about from 1 Samuel. And not only has David moved his capital to Jerusalem and set it up as the headquarters of his kingdom as well as the place where his own palace has been built for him to dwell in. But now we're at that point where God is going to move in his, himself. And so we enter this part called God's place. We have God's person, which is David. Now Jerusalem is God's place. And that place is the one that God had been talking about throughout the Torah, such as in Deuteronomy chapter 12 when he said, you shall seek the Lord at the place which the Lord your God will choose from all your tribes to establish his name there for his dwelling, and there you shall come. Jerusalem is that place. As we read in Psalm 132, that place that God desired to dwell. And so this is the time where that promise comes to fulfillment. So we begin looking in the text. The first couple of verses describe how David as we know from the previous chapter, had become king of all the tribes of Israel. He defeated the Philistines and he established Jerusalem as his new capital. Uh, and evidently, he seems to be aware that if he wants his kingdom to be successful, uh, the Lord of hosts must be with him. This seems to echo what Moses also said to the Lord in Exodus chapter 33. Let me read a few words from Exodus 33, starting in verse 13, Moses said, Now therefore I pray you, if, you have found, if I have found favor in your sight, let me know your ways that I may know you, so that I may find favor in your sight. Consider too that this nation is your people. And he, that is God, said, My presence shall go with you, and I will give you rest. Then he said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not lead us up from here. For how then can it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not by your going with us so that we, I and your people, may be distinguished from all the other people who are on the face of the earth? So indeed, without God's presence, 
There's no point in going forward, and David realizes this. Remember also that God's presence was inextricably linked to the ark of the covenant, the ark of God, even as we read there in verse 2. Now David again, verse 1, gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000, and David arose and went with all the people who were with him to Baale Judah, that's Kiryat Yarim, to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the very name of the Lord of hosts who is enthroned above the cherubim. Uh, this, uh, we heard this in, in the psalm. We heard this in our song today, Arise, O Lord, but it also echoes back to Numbers chapter 10 uh, when, when Moses uh, went forth with the ark. It says in Numbers 10, 35, Then it came about when the ark set out that Moses said, Rise up, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered. And let those who hate you flee before you. And when it came to rest, he said, Return, O Lord, to the myriad thousands of Israel. So here at the outset of our passage, we're alerted to this important and powerful vessel, which is the place where God abides. Often referred to as his throne or his footstool. And in this text even, uh, uh, it says, the Lord himself is enthroned above the cherubim. So here we are, they're going to go get the ark. And uh, in the beginning here, I need to give you a little bit more background, okay, before we really get moving into the text. Um, because let's remember that at the beginning of the Samuel story, the ark of God had been taken by the Philistines, right, after they defeated the Israelites in 1 Samuel chapter 4. We read there, so the Philistines fought and Israel was defeated. And every man fled to his tent and the slaughter was very great. For there fell of Israel 30,000 foot soldiers. And the ark of God was taken, and the two sons of Eli died, Eli the priest. And so here we see the journey. David and his men make their way to Baale Yeshua, uh, sorry, Baale Yehuda, <laughs> Baale Judah, which is, uh, as you look at different references to that city, another name for Kiryat Jearim or Kiryat Yearim. It's less than 10 miles to the northwest of Jerusalem. In fact, on the hills around Kiryat Yearim, there's a beautiful college, Ibex College. It's a, it's a believing college there and you can look over their biblical garden and see those beautiful hills but it's definitely a very mountainous region and so David goes there to bring the ark back to its home well to its new home in Jerusalem but how did he get to Kiryat Yarim let's not forget in 1 Samuel chapter 6 that after the ark had afflicted the cities of the Philistines they decided you know what let's just send it back to Israel. Uh, they decided they would place it on a new cart led by two cows who of their own accord walked the ark to Beth Shemesh. That doesn't appear on the map, but Beth Shemesh would have been about another 10 miles or so away from Kiryat Yarim over here. And once the ark got there, the men slaughtered the ox, set the ark on a, on a stone, made offerings to the Lord. However, uh, Unfortunately, we're told that the ark struck down 50,000, over 50,000 people from Beth Shemesh. Why? It says because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. So the people of Beth Shemesh begged the people of Kiryat Yarim, take the ark, get it up in the house of Abinadab up on the hill, a Levite family there. And so there it remained until David finally came to bring it home. So it's amazing to see that this scene in this chapter is sort of a, an ultimate reversal, right? An undoing of the tragedy of that first event uh, when the ark was taken, when the priesthood was defeated. But here God's ark is returning to where it belongs and David even selects 30,000 men, the same number that perished on the day the ark was taken. Uh, that is the number that he chooses to bring the ark back home again to its rightful place. So let's look at the next few verses to see how does David go about bringing the ark of God to Jerusalem. Uh, verses 3 and 4 begin to describe this. They placed the ark of God on a new cart that they might bring it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, and Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were leading the new cart. So they brought it with the ark of God from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, and Ahio was walking ahead of the ark. 
So just as the ark had arrived in Kiryat Yarim, so it departs on a new cart led by oxen. Ahio and Uzzah, the sons or the descendants of Abinadab, went with the cart. Apparently, uh, Ahio led the cart, and Uzzah must have been bringing up the rear. And meanwhile, in verse 5, we see David and all the house of Israel celebrating before the Lord. Verse 5 says, Meanwhile, David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with all kinds of instruments made of fir wood and with lyres, harps, tambourines, castanets, and cymbals. So it was an amazing celebration. The Hebrew word for celebrating is shachak, which uh, means to play. Sometimes the word shachak means to play in the sense of making sport or even mocking. Uh, but I think in this case, it implies the kind of playing on instruments and, and singing and dancing. Uh, and that's what David is doing in his, his entourage as they lead the celebration, as they bring the ark back to Jerusalem. But as we see from verse 6 on, the celebrations are cut short by tragedy. So when they came to the threshing floor of Nahon, Uzzah reached out to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen nearly upset it. And the anger of the Lord burned against Uzzah, and God struck him down there for his irreverence, and he died there by the ark of God. <sighs> Seems a little intense, right? It's like, okay, you got the ark. It's on a cart. The oxen apparently upset the cart, and what does Uzzah do? He wants to reach out and help. And he reaches out. And instead, as he touches the ark, is struck down. It seems that even though he wanted to help, apparently touching the ark of God in an unprescribed manner is an instant death sentence. And, you know, just ask those men of Beth Shemesh who lost over 50,000 people from looking into the ark. And everything comes to a halt, and the celebration is ceased. And David's celebration is turned to anger. Look at verse 8. David became angry because of the Lord's outburst against Uzzah. And that place is called Peretz Uzzah to this day. The same verb that was ascribed to God in his outbreak against Uzzah, his anger, is now attributed to David as he senses this anger at what happened. Is he angry at Uzzah? Is he angry at the Lord? Is he angry just at the tragedy of the whole situation? But it does cause us to pause and say, wait a minute, why did this thing happen? Here's an apparently innocent man who wants to help in a, in a time of crisis, and yet God strikes him down. How could God do such a thing? In the last chapter, in chapter 5, God is sometimes called Baal Perazim, the Lord of the breakthrough. Why? Because he broke through against the Philistines, but now he breaks out or breaks through against his own people. And so David named that place of victory Baal Peretzim, but he names this place of tragedy Peretz Uzzah. So the word Peretz keeps breaking through our text. <laughs> because God will break through. God is God. And he's not partial. He's great. God is awesome. God is powerful and mighty. And his power can break through for you or against you. It all depends on perhaps how you approach him. How did David approach the presence of God? Well, not according to the Torah. If you look back in Numbers chapter 4, God gives very specific instructions about how the priests were to bear these vessels, particularly the ark of God. And it was not on a cart and led by uh, cows, by the way. It was with the priests uh, holding them through poles up on their shoulders, bearing the ark in that way. And why, God says in Numbers chapter 4, why this way? It says, so that they will not touch the holy objects and die. God does care for his people, but his power is great. And so how do we approach the power of God's presence? How do we esteem the power of God's presence? And how does that affect our attitude and our actions toward him, right? Let's remember God is great. God is powerful. God is majestic in holiness, uh, God is not just a sweet, cozy, cuddly God who's just waiting for us to tell him to do whatever we ask him, right? Uh, he, you know, if we don't get what we want, what do we do? Do we just kick God to the curb and, and uh, you know, hope that he'll do our bidding? Even David, 
who had experienced God's presence in his life and seen his deliverance over and over again, I think he began to see God in a whole new light on this day, up close, personal, and powerful. So now he's afraid. And as he's afraid in verse uh, 9, we see David was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? Keep reading. Well, David was unwilling to move the ark of the Lord into the city of David with him, but David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. So what should he do? Maybe nothing. Let's put it away. Let's park the ark for now at the house of this Obed-Edom. Some people wonder, is, uh, is a Gittite, what does that mean? Some people wondered if he's from Gath. Is he a Philistine? Uh, looking forward into First Chronicles, we see the Obed-Edom is, the, is the, a priestly family. And git is from the, from the word uh, got, which means uh, a, a wine vat or a, a press. So uh, it could be used of a lot of different place names. So he's Obed-Edom the Gittite. But that's where he leaves the ark. And it's like, let me just cool down and, and wait a while. For three months, the ark sits there. And maybe that's a good idea, right? Sometimes it's important for us to just stop what we're doing and take the time to reevaluate what is the proper approach? And maybe we could also prevent further problems if we, if we do that. That's what David decided to do. Take time to consider uh, his appreciation for the power of the presence of God and the proper way to encounter him. Meanwhile, verse 11, thus the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. So the presence of God doesn't only have to be a source of destruction, but a source of blessing as Obed-Edom discovered. So the question remains, if God is holy and powerful, how do we enter his presence without being destroyed? We see how critical it is to enter God's presence with trembling, with, with a proper appreciation for his power and what that means. And by the way, that doesn't only mean we, we cower in fear from God, but that should give us amazing confidence. This is God. He is powerful. When we enter his presence, think of the things God can do. Uh, and so that is an important uh, assessment, too, of God and his power. But not only does he say, enter my presence with trembling, right? Because God also invites us into his presence to enter his presence with joy. And I think that's what we see unfold in the second half of the chapter, beginning in verse 12. And David started to notice this. Wait a minute, God's blessing. He's not only destroying. Look at uh, verse 12. It says, Now it was told King David, saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him on account of the ark of God. So David went up, and, or rather he went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. So he had taken the time to learn the proper way to approach God's holiness. And of course, that means following the Torah, right? We, we, we learned that the proper way was for the priest to carry it. Um, but ultimately, we realize that as he follows and reverences God properly, he experiences not just celebration, but actually great joy. It says, with gladness at the end of verse 12, and the Hebrew is simcha, which is the word we use for rejoicing. And what does that rejoicing look like? Well, the chapter unfolds how that rejoicing played out. Uh, verse 13, out of a reverence for God, David makes sacrifices after those bearing the ark had taken six steps. Uh, we read there in verse 13, so it was that when the bearers of the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed an ox and a fatling. A lot of people wonder, does that mean every six paces they stopped and did another sacrifice? That might have taken a year or two. Uh, but um, at least we know after the first six paces, he stopped and he had a sacrificial offering. And he said, look, let's give God the glory and the honor right here at the beginning of our journey. And uh, notice that the ark is, it tells us, those bearing the ark, the bearers of the ark. So it, it goes out of its way to subtly tell us that they are finally following God's instructions. Um, 
as prescribed in the Torah. And when this passage is, is kind of retold in First uh, Chronicles chapter 15, uh, we're given a little bit more information. This is kind of the, this is kind of the nuts and bolts uh, version of it. But in First Chronicles 15, in verse, chap- verse 13, David explicitly addresses this desire to get it right this time. And so speaking to the Levites, David says, because you did not carry it at the first, the Lord our God made an outburst on us. For we did not seek him according to the ordinance. And so it goes on to say the sons of the Levites carried the ark of God on their shoulders with the poles thereon as Moses had commanded according to the word of the Lord. So imagine that. Trusting in God and and following his word leads to rejoicing. (laughs) Uh, Maybe that's not bad advice. And this really is a time of great rejoicing. Uh, This is probably the most rejoicing we've seen up until now in the scriptures. It goes on in 14 and 15 to say that David was dancing before the Lord with all his might. And it says David was wearing a linen ephod. And so David and all the house of Israel, Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of trumpet. So again, a great rejoicing. Musical instruments, shouting, trumpets, and there's David dancing before the Lord with all his might. I scoured the internet to find this old uh, uh, Renaissance era, maybe romantic era sculpture, a bas-relief in terracotta of David. It, the arms are broken off. I'm sure he was doing something <laughs> worshipful, uh, and the others around him offering sacrifices and playing trumpets and and you see the priest behind him bearing the ark. Uh, Just a wonderful reminder of the joy that was being uh, manifest in that celebration. Dancing before the Lord with all his might. And David girt in priestly garments. Now that should cause us to pause (laughs) Uh, because David's wearing the robe of the priest. He's wearing the ephod. I didn't bring a slide to show you like all the different layers of the priestly garments, but they're pretty amazing, right? The blue robe over the tunic and the, the bells and pomegranates around the, the, the fringes and then this woven, artistically woven um, ephod that's wrapped around. Uh, it would have been a turban and a crown as well. Not the crown of a king, but that of a priest. So David removes his his kingly garments as he dances before the Lord uh, to show that God is the true king, right? And he is God's servant. But at the same time, by wearing these uh, priestly garments, he does, in a way, invest himself with a new kind of authority. And that might raise some questions because he's not from the tribe of Levi. (laughs) And yet here he is, dressed as a priest, bringing the ark of God into Jerusalem. There was once a king in Jerusalem who served as both king and priest uh, to the Most High God. You remember Melchizedek uh, from Genesis who met Abraham. And here it seems like David is, is prefiguring a little bit of what Psalm 110 tells us, that David's greater son would also be anointed king and eternal priest after the order of Melchizedek. Wouldn't that be, isn't that going to be a great day to see him, our king and priest, Yeshua, enter triumphantly to reign and rule from Jerusalem. I am uh, excited for that day, and I can't wait to see the, the joy and celebration in his presence. And so this is the kind of joy you would want to see on a day like this. And, and even at the height of this display of David's heart, right, humbling himself, submitting to the Lord, rejoicing, dancing with all his might, yet we get to verse 16 and we're kind of jarred out of our jubilation by yet another tragedy in this chapter. So just as the initial attempt to to transport the ark to Jerusalem uh, was met by a tragedy when when Uzzah unintentionally uh, displayed irreverence before the Lord, so here we encounter the intentional irreverence, it seems, of Michal. Uh, Let's read verse 16. Then it happened, as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, that Michal, the daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. And she despised him in her heart. What a crashing halt 
for us as we read this, as we hear these words, uh, to these celebrations, to the rejoicing, to see Michal looking down out of her window, looking down kind of not only literally but figuratively at David, leaping and dancing before the Lord. Uh, you know, as we go back to 1 Samuel, it says that Michal loved David when they got married. It tells us then that uh, she helped David actually from a window, right, to escape from the hand of Saul. She let him down out of a window in verse, 1 Samuel 19, but it seems like she never left that window. Here she is again back in her window, and she never seemed to let David back into her heart. Instead, she despises him in her heart. And her spite and her, her anger seems to not just be aimed at David, but as we'll see later, towards the Lord as well. But back to the rejoicing. Let's get back to the uh, text in verse 17 where we see the ark brought to its place. Verse 17 says, So they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent which David had pitched for it, And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. When David had finished offering the the burnt offerings and the peace, peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. Further, he distributed to all the people, to all the multitude of Israel, both men and women, a cake of bread and one of dates and one of raisins to each one. Then all the people departed, each to his house. So after the the ark is brought, David had prepared for this moment. He prepared a tent uh, for the ark to be moved into. And he prepared the offerings to offer. He blesses the people. And it's amazing, again, to think of these last two acts of David, uh, offering burnt offerings and peace offerings and blessing the people in the name of the Lord. Because, again, combined with the fact that he's adorned in priestly garments, you know, these were things that the priests were to do for the people. Uh, in fact, the blessing in the name of the Lord reminds us of what we do at the end of our services so often, which is the Aaronic benediction. So I want to read that passage in Numbers 6, 22 to 27. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and to his sons, saying, Thus you shall bless the sons of Israel. You shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace so they shall invoke my name on the sons of Israel and I then will bless them. Here comes that name of the Lord again. The name uh, that dwelt above the cherubim on the ark. The name that is bestowed with this blessing. Uh, What a great picture of God blessing his people Israel. Uh, you, you kind of wish the Bible could just end here, right? And <laughs> say, okay, great, perfect. All the promises have been fulfilled. This is, again, uh, or kind of a, that perfect reversal of that national tragedy when the ark had been taken, when Israel was defeated and the priesthood had been broken. Uh, remember when Eli was the priest, and he and his sons were acting corruptly in the Lord's service. Do you remember the man of God who came to him in 1 Samuel chapter 2? And these were his words. He said, Why do you kick at my sacrifice and my offering, which I have commanded in my dwelling, and honor your sons above me? He goes on to say, Those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me will be lightly esteemed. Behold, he goes on, Behold, the days are coming when I will break your strength and the strength of your father's house. But, he goes on to say, I will raise up for myself a faithful priest, who will do according to what is in my heart and in my soul, and I will build him an enduring house, and he will walk before my anointed always. So David here almost seems to be the picture of that perfect priest that God had promised. Uh, But we uh, have a couple more chapters to go to discover that David is not the perfect priest and king that we've been waiting for. But he does seem to picture it, to foreshadow it, as he wears these priestly garments. But we know, even as we've looked ahead already at Psalm 110, that there is a son of David, the Messiah himself, who is to be this one, this perfect priest, this perfect king. Sadly, again, the the wonderful rejoicing of the narrative doesn't end, but we go back into the house of David and we meet Michal 
and her bitterness one more time. David doesn't even have a chance to, to bless his own household, right? After blessing all the people of Israel, he enters his home, and there he's, he's interrupted, right? Preempted by Michal, who unloads her contempt uh, and pours on him like the most scathing sarcasm, accusing him of performing lewdly for the young women as if that was his intention. Let's read verse 20. But when David returned to bless his household, Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, how the king of Israel distinguished himself today. He uncovered himself today in the eyes of his servant's maids as one of the foolish ones shamelessly uncovers himself. So it's not only sad, her her feelings and her attitude and her expression. But what's equally sad is that after all this time of knowing Michal and David and what they've been through and what they've been through not only together but apart and now back together again, that actually this is the first portion of text where they actually have a dialogue. You know, they've spoken words in each other's presence in past chapters, but here they actually talk to each other and sadly, it's not a great conversation. What is it she says that she essentially disdains him. Uh, and you'll notice that she's called not Michal, the wife of David, but three times in this chapter, Michal, the daughter of Saul. The, the narrator kind of has a certain feeling about her behavior because she's truly her father's daughter in her disrespect, right? Her irreverence for God, her inability or perhaps refusal to see God for who, all that he is, all that he's worth, to know him, to come to trust him, to come to experience his blessing, and yet she's shut off to that. Now David doesn't just take it lying down, right? He's got his own response to this. And after reminding Michal, uh, let's read verse 21, actually, in 22, his response. So David said to Michal, it was before the Lord who chose me above your father and above all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore, I will celebrate before the Lord. I will, more, I will be more lightly esteemed than this and will be humble in my own eyes. But with the maids of whom you have spoken, with them I will be distinguished. So first he puts Michal in her place a little bit. He reminds her that uh, God has chosen me above your father and above everybody else in his household to be ruler over God's people Israel. But then he takes her accusation, right, about being concerned with what the public thinks uh, or whether he'd be distinguished or not. And he uses those very words when she said, how distinguished. But he uses that word because the Hebrew word is kavod. That's the word for glory. That's the word for honor. How honorable, how glorified. <laughs> well, she said it in pure sarcasm, but he's saying, no, 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 this is important. Let's talk about honor who are we honoring? And there is this contrast between honor and humility or being lightly esteemed. In fact, the man of God spoke it to Eli in 1 Samuel 2. Those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me will be lightly esteemed. And so David takes up those two terms to even say, I don't mind if I'm lightly esteemed because I want to be humble in my own estimation because I know God, to whom the honor is due, will also honor me. David came to realize that uh, God was powerful. God was important. <laughs> and that it's no shame in the presence of God to make ourselves nothing. In fact, it's all we really should do. But Michal was interested in the outward appearance, in personal importance. And she just seemed to not be able to grasp what it really meant to humble yourself in the sight of the Lord so that he could lift you up. It takes us until James chapter 4 to hear those words, but humble yourself in the sight of the Lord that he may lift you up. But instead, as a result, we read in verse 23, the last verse, that Michal, the daughter of Saul, again, the daughter of Saul, had no child until the day of her death. So instead of trusting the Lord, instead of honoring the Lord, and as a result, experiencing the blessing David came to give, she instead becomes a living example of what God had said would be the curse 
of those who do not trust the Lord, right? Uh, she could not have children the rest of her life. She was separated from David's love, but ultimately from God's love. That's the picture we take away at the end of this chapter. So again, it brings us to the question, how do we enter into God's presence? With fear and trembling or with celebration and rejoicing? Is, is God powerful and dangerous or is he loving and gentle? The answer is yes, 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 and yes, right? As Lewis uh, said, the extent to which we find ourselves experiencing his pleasure or experiencing wrath depends on the way we react or rather respond to him. How do we esteem God? Is he a pocket-sized good luck charm that we just call on to grant our wishes and make our life easier and more comfortable? Are we concerned more with our own appearance and how we worship God only as much as it looks good outwardly? While in our hearts, like Michal, we secretly are bitter and despise him. Um, that's an important, honest question to ask. Or do we know and appreciate how powerful it is to have his presence in our lives? Again, those who honor me, I will honor. Those who despise me will be lightly esteemed. So again, the answer to the question is to enter into his presence we enter with trembling, and yes, we enter his presence with joy. But I want to kind of move on to one last point, because, uh, you know, does a relationship with God simply mean, uh, you know, whatever you put in is what you get out, <laughs> right? I don't think so. Because if that was the case, we would all be the most miserable. We could try our hardest to put in, but even after all our best efforts, we would still uh, discover we can't love God enough in our own strength. We keep falling on our faces every day, actually throughout the day, every day. And that's why, that while God does invite us into his presence and he does encourage us to enter the, his presence with trembling, but he also invites us into his presence with rejoicing. Ultimately, the only way we can enter his presence and remain there at all is through Yeshua, through Jesus, that we enter his presence through Yeshua, the Messiah. Because why? Because our sins have separated us from God. You know, this started when our first parents rebelled in the garden. They were exiled from his presence. And it continues to this day with our own rebellion. And what's amazing is that the ark of God was a picture of that way back. You know, we could come to that place and there could be a blood sacrifice brought into his presence for our atonement. But this, of course, was only accessible to one person, the, the Kohen Hagadol, the high priest, once a year on Yom Kippur. Uh, and, of course, if this wasn't handled right, it was a certain death. So, so it was always a very precarious situation. But God prepared all of this to show us both our need for redemption, but ultimately our Redeemer himself, the one he would send, who is the great high priest, the one promised, pictured by David, but promised in Psalm 110, the one after the order of Melchizedek, that great son of David, the son of God, Yeshua, the Messiah. Yeshua came at the right time, at the appointed time. He entered Jerusalem, also to the sound of great rejoicing. And while Yeshua lived among us, he proved to be the power of God. I've been reading again through the book of Luke, and every time uh, the disciples say, who is this that can still the storm? Who is this who can have authority over demons? Who is this who can raise the dead? Yeshua is none other than the power of God in our midst. And he came there to Jerusalem, to that place God chose for his name to dwell. But he didn't come to blast us with his power, right? He, he took that power and he laid it down. He humbled himself and died as our atonement. Because God, who is so great, has such love for us that we, through Yeshua, can enter into his presence. That's unfathomable, and yet that's what God did. That should help us appreciate how awesome his power is, which we're not worthy to approach, and yet simultaneously, his great love for us, the value at which he esteems each one of you, is that he would give his own life to bring you into his presence. So I love what we read in, in Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 19. It says, Therefore, brethren, 
since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Yeshua, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh. And since we have a great high priest, or rather a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near. Let us enter his presence. Let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. God is so good to provide that way into his presence. But again, how will we respond to that opportunity? Whose glory and whose honor are we seeking to see? So my last question is, for anyone here, have you taken that step to seek his presence, to enter into God's presence, to allow him to move into your heart, right, where he wants to dwell? God wants to dwell in you And how does that happen? You invite Yeshua. Have you invited Jesus, Yeshua, to be your sin bearer, to be your Lord? Because he wants to rule and reign in your life. He wants to lift your eyes off of yourself and off of your circumstances and to fix your eyes on him and to know and honor him as God. That may require some fear and trembling throughout the rest of your life, but he wants to lead you to great rejoicing. That's the great promise of God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you for, even in this chapter, revealing your great power. How awesome, and at times fearful that is, and yet, God, your, your desire is not to destroy us, or we would have been destroyed a long time ago. But Lord, your desire was to find a way to allow us to come into your presence, to experience your power And Lord, you'd provided that way through Yeshua, through Jesus, our Messiah. Lord, thank you that uh, we have this word in the words of David who who saw from your Holy Spirit this promise to come, Lord. But we get to see that it happened. And we know by trusting in Yeshua and by the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives how true it is and how powerful you are. And so once again, God, if there is anyone here now today who has not humbled their hearts to say, yes, God, be the Lord of all the earth and be abiding in my heart, be enthroned in my heart, that today, even now, they would call on your name, call on Yeshua to take our sin and to uh, make us your children. Lord, we thank you that you've paid the price to take away our sin. You paid the price to make us your children, Lord, that we might know your power and your presence now in our lives, but Lord, have that great assurance that when you come to rule and reign on the throne of David, Lord, we will be rejoicing in your presence on that day. Because of that, God, we just give you praise and thank you. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen.